And it says, so they set slave masters over them, that's the Hebrew children, to afflict them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses as storage cities for Pharaoh. But the more they afflicted the Hebrew people, the more they multiplied and the more they spread. So the Egyptians dreaded the presence of B'nai Yisrael. They worked them harshly. Everybody say harshly. And made their lives bitter. Everybody say bitter. bitter. With hard labor, with martyr and brick, doing all sorts of work in the fields. In all their labors, they worked them with, everybody say it, cruelty. Moreover, the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sifra, Shifra, and the other Puan said, when you help the Hebrew women during childbirth, look at the sex. If it's a son, then kill him. But if it's a daughter, she may live. Yet the midwives feared God. So they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let their boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this? Let letting the boys live. The midwives told the Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They're like animals and give birth before the midwives come to them. So God was good to the midwives and the people multiplied, growing very numerous. Because the midwives feared God, you better listen to this because I'm not even preaching on it, but you better get it right now. Because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. But Pharaoh charged all his people saying, you're to cast every son that's born into the river, but let every daughter live. Because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. It's very important. Okay, listen, there are a couple of things I just want to touch on. And I could say they're rabbits. We're going to chase a couple of rabbits, but they're really not in the true sense of what we mean a rabbit to be. It's something that really doesn't pertain to the message or the heart of the message that we're doing today. And, and truthfully, these do pertain to the heart of the message, even though you might not see it at the beginning. So I, I want to mention first, the midwives had a fear of God. People, I'm a guy model, if you didn't know that. I have an analytical mind. You know, that's why an analytical mind gets us in trouble with our wives a lot of times. How many of you men know that? Because your wife comes and she just needs to tell you what's going on. And you're, the minute she starts talking, you figure it out. You've got the solution. She doesn't want the solution. When will we learn that? They just want you to hear them. Don't fall asleep when you're trying. Listen to them. Lord, help us. I'm an analytical mind, and, and I, I'm, I'm just a, I'm glad I'm not a fish, because I would probably be a catfish. I'm a bottom liner. I'm not a bottom dweller, but I'm a bottom liner. And, and, and when I see things like this Torah portion and, and the fear of God was in these women's lives, you know what I think? Look, one of two things is true. Here's the bottom line with me. One of two things is true. Either there is a God or there's not a God. One of those things is true. Either there's a God behind all this creation or there is not. Now, I'm, I find myself in a real quandary at times because Yeshua said, don't call, call any man or woman a fool. And the scripture says, the guy that says there is no God is a fool. So if you're here today and you don't believe there's a God or if you're watching online and you don't think there's a God, I don't want to call you a fool, but... I would like to point you to a couple of places in the Tanakh <laughs> that you might learn something. How could anybody look at this creation, look out into the heavens, read about, we, we told our grandson, we want you to come up at some point and just watch this video that one of our Shamashim Biff gave us years ago about the creation. It's just fascinating. It's the most fascinating video. It's done by believers and it, 
and it just talks about how big the universe is and, and how we can't measure it. We can't find the end of it. They think it might still be expanding. They've got telescopes that reach billions and trillions and trillions of miles, light years, and, and they cannot find the end of the creation. Somebody's behind this. There is a God. If there is a God, and, and I don't think you'd be here today if you didn't believe there's a God. So if there is a God, one of two things is true. He either has revealed himself or he has not revealed himself. And we're all just shooting in the dark. Now, if he's revealed himself, and I don't think you'd be here today if you weren't thinking he's revealed himself. If he has revealed himself, somebody's right and a lot of bodies are wrong. Somebody's got a true revelation of God if he's revealed himself. And some of you might be like my son was when he was at 14 years of age and came to me one day with a heart towards God and saying, Dad, how do we know we're right? That's a good question for a 14-year-old to ask. That's a legitimate question. How do we know we're right? I said, Ricky, sit down. Listen to me. You see this right here? You show me another God on the earth who has written something 2,600 and 2,700 years before it happens and told you what's going to happen and, and kept a people together, a people group together for all, for 2,000 years, he kept a people group together with no land and no language. They had no land, no language, and they stayed together as a people group, even though they were scattered over the face of the earth. And after 2,700 years and 2,600 years of prophesying years and years ago of the event that would happen in 1948, he brought them back to Israel and they became a nation again. Show me some God that's done that. It's incredible. It's incredible. Listen, listen. If this is the revelation of God, and it is the revelation of God, I want to tell you one more thing that happens before we go to the main point. The main point today is slavery. And um, we're coming up on the African-American speech. You know, that February is the month to celebrate God's deliverance from the African-Americans. So, I, I, that's good, but that's not where I'm going with this. I'm talking about your slavery this morning. But before I do, I want to remind you of one more point. This is extremely important. How many of you would like to walk with God? How many people would like to know God and walk with God? All of us. Pete raises two hands. That means you want to run with God. Look, these next two verses just two, they're the last, they're two of the last three verses in this parasha. And, and I want you to hear where Moshe, Moses got when he got that word from God, go deliver my people. He's got the word from God. How many of you have heard the voice of God? Anybody ever heard the voice of the Lord? Moshe got a call from God and God says, go get him. Moshe says, look, I can't speak. And God said, I don't want to hear that. Aaron can speak for you. Go back and you deliver my people. He goes back on the word of God to deliver the people. And look what he says near the end of this parasha. Very important. So Moses returned to Adonai and said, Adonai, why have you brought evil on this people? Is this why you sent me ever, ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name? He has brought evil on these people. You have not delivered your people at all. Look at all you pious people out there. I would never tell God that. Oh, we tell God that all the time. 
All you have to do is start looking around at your circumstances for a little while after you've gotten a word from God. Just start looking at your circumstances for a little while. Read it with me. So Moses returned to Adonai and said, Adonai, why have you brought evil on these people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought evil on these people. You've not delivered your people at all. Oh. Oh, my, 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 my. People, listen, would you just settle this? Try to settle this once and for all. God doesn't owe you an answer on any of the circumstances in your life. He doesn't have to explain himself why he leads you like he leads you. If you've committed your life to him, yours is to show obedience. Yours is to get to know God so well that you trust him. Listen, if you start looking around, I promise you, you can find all kinds of things that'll make you doubt God. Look, look, at, look at the circumstances in the word right there. Have you ever thought, Lord, why did you, why did you send them to Egypt to begin with? Why don't you send some rain over the land of Canaan and get some crops and they wouldn't get hungry and they wouldn't have one of the brothers down there. It, this wouldn't, and they wouldn't have developed strongly and multiplied down there and become slave labor for the Egyptians. Why did you do that? You didn't have to do it that way. I don't get it. Listen, in every circumstance in the word of God, when God gives a word, when God gives a word to your life, I promise you, if you don't know it, I promise you after you get the word, most likely all Sheol is going to break loose against you. And you're going to wonder, what in the world, God? I followed your word. When we came down here, I've shared this before. When we came down here, the first month we were here, everybody say 30 days. 30 days. We didn't make 30 days. And we honestly would have gone back home. We would have gone back to Stephenville. We, we thought, we didn't bargain for this, and I don't want to go into the details. You just have to know what I'm trying to tell you is when you get a call from the Lord, when you get a word from God to do something and you start out to do it, you better be ready to trust God with all your heart, with all your soul, with your body, with everything in you. You better learn how to trust God. You know what trust God means? That means if God were standing behind me right now and he said, you fall back, I'll catch you. I didn't hear him and I'm not going to fall back. <laughs> but that's what it means. Don't you love, if you're an adult, don't you love to teach a Shabbat school and, and get a child beforehand, a little six-year-old boy or a seven-year-old girl and, 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 and just say, listen, we're going to help these other kids understand what it's like to follow God. So I'm going to tell you fall back and I want you to fall back. And they fall back and you catch them. And you make a great picture of the way the Lord feels about us. He's going to catch us. But you better be sure you hear the voice of the Lord right. And that he's told you to do such and such. If he has, you can trust him. My daughter used to sing that song God is so kind, wise to, to be mistaken. God is too good to be unwise. So if you don't understand, when you can't see his hand, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Boy, that is just such a simple, it's almost like a kid song. But God help us to do it as adults. When you don't get it, when you, when you know you've heard God, but, but everything goes south. And you can't understand what's happening. And you can't see the plan. You can't trace his hand. You don't, God, where? Am, am I preaching to a choir? Is anybody, has anybody been there with God before where you don't know where God is? Only about 20 of us. Wow. I'm so proud of the rest of you. You just know how to walk and trust God all the time. Listen, 
The name of my message today is the God factor because it's obvious from the scriptures that God makes the difference in a life. And when those midwives feared God, it moved the hand of God to bless their houses, not just the multiplication of the Hebrew Jewish children. He blessed their houses. God, God is explicitly mentioned in Scripture in 65 books. God, the Lord, is explicitly mentioned in 65 books. You're like, but, but there's 66 books. That's right. He's implicitly mentioned in one, only one book. If you don't say it out loud, don't help your neighbor. How many of you know what that book is where God's never mentioned? The book of Esther, nearly everybody in Beth Messiah knows it because Purim is coming up and we're going to have a party celebrating the deliverance of God. But God's name, yeah, we can clap for the Lord. God's name, he's, he's never mentioned in the book, but when it says they're fasting, believe me, they're fasting in the eyes of the Lord from their heart, and God answers, and God moves and saves the Jewish people. Prayer changes things, and, and faith is the greatest evidence that God's listening to us if we pray. If we pray, it's the greatest evidence of faith in our lives that we really believe God is, and he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. But now I want to pull us back to slavery for a minute because Shaul of Tarsus goes into this idea of slavery. And people, I, I quoted Romans 6 to my wife this week because I memorized it years ago and I've been over it a lot and I quoted it to her. You have to be there. I wish y'all could be just little bugs on the wall watching when I'm, when I'm going over the, the, my message. I'm telling my wife what's on my heart. And, and I look at her and she's going, <laughs> I'm quoting the word of God. And she's like, they're not going to get that. And, and I have to admit, when I, I, I memorized it out of a translation that is a little hard to understand, but I even went to the Tree of Life Bible and looked at it. And that's even pretty hard to understand in this. So that's your homework. I'm not even going to bring it up today. I'm not going to quote it to you because I don't want to look over there and see my wife going mm, like that. And so I'm, I'm giving you homework. Go see what Shaul of Tarsus says about this slavery. Basically, I'm going to just summarize it real quickly in a couple of sentences. It's, it's Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Go look at it. Basically, Paul's saying, listen, you're going to be a slave all your life. You're going to be a slave to unrighteousness or you're going to be a slave to righteousness. You're going to be a slave to iniquity and or you're going to be a slave to Messiah. Did you know if you, I love the Tree of Life Bible. It does give a good translation on this. The Tree of Life Bible lets Shaul, uh, who else? Shimon Kepha. Uh, Yehuda, Judah, uh, Yaakov, the book of James, all four of those guys, I know for sure, I didn't go into the others, all four of those guys at one point, you know what they refer to themselves as? And the tree of life gets it, nails it. Slaves of Messiah. We're bought. We're blood bought. We belong to God. He bought us with the blood of his son. We're slaves. We're bond servants of Messiah. So, what I want to do today is, is not look where Paul did it. I encourage you to go read that, Romans 6. Go study it. Go look at it. He's like, you're either going to serve sin or you're going to serve God, righteousness, holiness. But Yeshua does it when he's having one of his discussions with the Judean elders. And they had some discussions that really a lot of times Christians, they get involved in these family discussions that Yeshua was having with his Jewish family. And they become, I don't know, I get a little nervous when, when Christians get in the middle of that Jewish family squabble between Yeshua and the, Jew, and the, the Jewish leaders, the Judean leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees and 
Have you ever thought about what Yeshua came into when he walked on the earth? Judaism, you think it was monolithic. It, listen, Judaism was splintered. There were Pharisees, there were Sadducees. You know the Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. And there were, there were Herodians, Jewish people that said, look, we're under the Roman rule and we, we let's be friends with them and let's see what we can get by being friends with them. There were zealots that said, we hate the Romans and anybody that would have anything to do with them. They were ready to fight for the independence of Israel. There were Essenes. Those were the, the guys out in the caves of, of the wilderness and, and writing scrolls that would later be found on the righteous one. And, and so all these different groups, and then here comes Yeshua into the middle of all of it, saying, I'm the way and I'm the truth and I'm the life. And you, if you want to come to the Father, you're going to have to come through me. He was having a discussion one day. He was telling the Judean leaders, look, they were arguing over something. And Yeshua said, listen, you're from beneath, I'm from above. You're of this world, I'm not of this world. I came to save this world. I came to change it. But they're having this discussion. And I would think, I don't know, I, I, the scriptures don't tell if it's heated or what. But you can tell there's a problem afoot. And they say to Yeshua, I love this. They say to him, who are you? And he says, I'm the same that I've been from the beginning. I have a lot of things to say and judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak only to the world those things which I hear of my father. And it says they didn't understand that he was talking to them about God the Father. And Yeshua said, this is in chapter 8 of John. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my father has says these things, that's what I speak. And he said, for the Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that are pleasing to him. And it says, as he spoke these words, many believed on him. This was an all Jewish crowd. How do I know that? I know that because of the next verse. It says as Yeshua was speaking and having this dialogue with the Judean leaders and, and just trying to say who he was, that he was sent from the Father, the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he came out of the heart of the Father, that he was manifest, that he's not of this world. He came to save this world. He's trying to get the point across. And it says as he does it, many believed on him and the very next verse says then Yeshua said to those Jewish people that believed if you continue in my word then you are my disciples and you'll know the truth and that truth will make you free and they said unto him listen to the audacity of this statement they said unto him we're Abraham's seed we've never been in bondage to anybody are you kidding me You've never been in bondage to anybody. You've been in bondage to the Babylonians and the Assyrians and you're under Rome right now. You don't even have the autonomy over your own nation. You, but but we're, we're Abraham's seed. We're never in bondage to anybody. And Yeshua said, you listen to me. Whoever continually practices sin, whoever cannot break sin off of him or herself, Whoever keeps habitually doing things that are wrong in the eyes of God, whoever keeps practicing the same sin over and over, you're a slave to that sin. And the slave won't abide forever, but the son will abide forever. Whoever, therefore, the son sets free is free indeed. Look. Beth Messiah, now I'm going to tell you what spawned this message. I'm, I'm worried. I don't want to say I'm worried. I get in trouble at my house. You say you're worried at my house. My wife, she doesn't say it to condemn me. She just reminds me worry is a sin. 
that's okay. Thank you for reminding me. But then somebody told Patsy and me just in the last month, and I think, I, I shouldn't say who I think it is because I'm, I'm not sure who it was, but God bless that lady. There was a lady, and I, and I don't want to tell you that I think it was Sue Sexton, but, but I don't, I, I'm not sure. This is, uh, but, but here's what either Sue or some lady equal in caliber with her before the eyes of the Lord said. I, I don't worry about you. I'm prayerfully concerned for you. Oh, you didn't get it. I'm like, oh, Patsy, Patsy, I am. You know, I would tell Patsy, I worry about you. And, and for a while, she would say, you should. And then she started saying, don't, don't worry about me. Worry is a sin. Pray for me. So now I say, Patsy, I am prayerfully concerned for you. Oh, I love that. Isn't that good? So, so listen, I am prayerfully concerned with the younger generation. I wish every millennial, and I don't want to set this guy up for fall, because usually when you brag on somebody publicly, there's a battle that goes on privately. But I tell you, I wish every millennial was like Nick Van Cleef and shot out of the, he's about the straightest era I've seen shot out of the bow of God in a long time. I get concerned for the millennial generation. And, and I even had one of my grandsons tell me, you know what a, a, a congregational leader, I heard him say, Saba, about us millennials. Now, my grandson's a millennial. And he says, he told me this. I'm not saying this. I didn't say this. I'm just repeating what somebody said. My grandson told me. He was there when he said it. And he said, this generation is the most, I wrote it down, biblically, where did I write it? This generation is the most biblically illiterate generation that America has produced ever. Biblically illiterate. They don't know the word of God. They, they work. Listen, it's not just the millennials. It's true of Xers and it's true of a lot of boomers. We don't know the word of God like we should. Yeshua said... If you want to be set free, you want to be free. It said many believed on him. We believe, we believe on you. Yeshua turns right back around to those Jewish people and says, you listen to me. If you continue in my word, then you'll know the truth and that truth will make you free. Listen, people. I, I, I love everybody who helps other people in the Messiah. I know some people are involved in inner healing ministries, deliverance ministries, and they, they counsel with people and they lay hands on them and pray for them. And I believe in prayer and I believe in deliverance. But I'm telling you, regardless, if you go through deliverance with somebody or, or God zaps you at some point, listen to me. You'll never maintain it if you don't stay in the Word of God. You have to stay in the Word of God. You say, Richard, why are you so hard on this? I'm hard on this because I was in bondage. I had a stronghold in my life. I don't like to talk about it publicly very much, but I've had women in the congregation tell me, brother, talk about it. Tell men they can be set free from this. It's killing our next generation. Listen, I know what bondage is like. I, 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 had, I had pornography in my life like nobody knew. My wife, oh my gosh, if she would have known it, she didn't know it until God had delivered me from it. And, and I told her about it and it hurt her. And I was like, I, you know, <laughs> have you ever been there where you're so excited to tell somebody about what God's done in your life, but you tell your wife and, and it hurts her. You're excited, kind of. You're really kind of bragging on God. You're like, I'm delivered. It's over. I go by those places. I don't care. It's over. I'm free. 
I'm like, God Almighty. But I had to work through with my wife because all those six years that we were first married and that was plaguing my life. And, and I was trying to hide it. Listen, I've told this before, but, but I told God I would do it again if he quickened it to me today. If you've got a stronghold in your life, you, you listen to me. A stronghold is like a bull nettle plant. Any of you know what a bull nettle plant is? I had them in Stephenville. It's a sandy soil. And, and these bull nettle plants would grow up. And they, if they were in the backyard, I had one in the backyard that was just bugging me. And I would mow it. And I thought, you're dead. And the next week I came back and it had grown up and it was bigger. One week, one week, and it grew up and it was bigger. And, I, so I, and it was hot. It was in the summer and I just mowed it again. I thought, surely it'll kill it. And I came back the next week and it was bigger than it had been the week before. And I said, you know what? <laughs> you really? You know, you ever talk to a plant? You know. <laughs> So I go and I get my sharpshooter shovel and sandy soil, I go down about 10 inches and I dig that thing up and I throw it out of the backyard. <laughs> and I mowed it two weeks later and it was bigger than it had been before. And I'm like, what in the world? So I got my sharpshooter back out and another shovel and I started digging down and kind of moving soil around and looking at, at, that, at the root because I didn't, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling, I must have missed all the root. And sure enough, I got down about two feet. Is that about two feet? I got about two feet down and this root had just been about that big, tubular root going straight down. And when I got two feet down, it enlarged to a tumor about that big around. And, but I said, well, I dare not just take it. I better see if there's something underneath. And sure enough, I got underneath it. There's another tube running down there. And, it went, and this thing was over five feet deep. I dug it out. I got down to where it had another bulb-like thing and it was kind of hairy strings running out roots. And I thought, are you kidding me? I got it. I never, I tore it up. I got it out of my yard. I never saw it again. But when God delivered me from that stronghold of pornography, people, I'm going to tell you something. This right here is a sharpshooter. It will dig up any root, any stronghold you have in your life. This will dig it up. That, that was the period that I've shared with you before. I started, I, di I didn't know it would work like this. I had never seen that verse, so I didn't know the principle of strongholds and Yeshua saying, if you continue in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But what I did know was I needed the word of God. And so I started memorizing some of the word of God and began taking a lot of it in. And that stronghold, I, I've shared publicly, I, I probably fell two or three times in the next year and a half. But then, it was over. It was over. It was like God Almighty. We, we, sang that, we, we sang that song this morning about Yeshua setting the slave free. Oh, God of Israel, my prayer is for Beth Messiah to be free, for every individual to be free, for men to be free with, listen, don't. You can con me. You can con your neighbor. You can con your wife. But you can't put one over on God. If there are things going on in your life, get some help and get in the Word of God. Get in the Word of God. You say, Richard, what, do you mean? what does that mean, continue in my Word? I think it means everything. Read it, meditate on it, see yourself in it, say it over you, memorize some of it. Do It just means continue in the Word of God. Listen. 
Seth Messiah, this is for the boomers and the Xers and the millennials and the ones coming after them. You have got to establish a time in the Word of God every day. You have to schedule it. Schedule. You've got to get in the Word. You, you, you say, well, I, I, you don't understand my schedule. I understand the Word of God. You make time for other things. You say, I, I don't really, I don't have time. Oh, excuse me. If I had my phone, I would pull it out and go. Oh, you got time for other stuff. I had somebody tell me, Saba Soma. Now I know that sounds like a grandson, but that's, I'm not saying that's who it was. Uh, Saba, I saw my, my time that I spent. Saba, that's ridiculous. And I thought, hey, we all have time we waste, but, but we better find time. We better make time for the thing that's most important in our life, and that is time in the Word of God. I know a ministry that I admire. In Beth Messiah, we give money. We support more of their shlichim, their sent out ones in Israel. Under Tikkun, we, we support more of them than any other ministry. We support, you say, why? They have fruit abounding in their lives. And they have a principle in that that I saw early on. When I was around any person from Tikkun, early morning they're not talking with you they're in the word of God every morning word of God every morning word of God Amen. first thing they just that's that's the way God led their ministry to do that's the way God should be leading all of us to do every day make time for the word of God we can quote the statistics of athletes how many passes are completed? Who's the best this? People, you ever hear the athletes start talking after a game? Oh, they, they just talk about, I've done this and I've done that. I'm so, they, they got an eye problem. And I'm not talking about that. They, listen, you wouldn't be anything if God hadn't given you the gift and you ought to be giving glory to God. Amen. People, Beth Messiah, listen, there is no substitute for this. If, if you want to be free, if you want to be a slave and serve that thing all your life, I, I know what it feels like. I wrestled with it for six years. God, I'm calling myself a believer and nobody knows. This is, this is terrible. I'd be humiliated. I'm free. I'm free from that. And, this, and, and, and ladies who are part of Beth Messiah have come to me and say, share that. Men need to hear that. You can be free. You can be free from this. You can be free from whatever stronghold is developed. I don't care. The Word of God will sharpshooter it, dig it up, get it out. You, you say, how does that work? I don't know. I'm telling you, it just works. All of a sudden, you wake up and it's over. You just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. As we said that, that message uh, a couple of weeks ago, keep doing what you see your father do. Your father doesn't have any strong, his strongholds are all righteousness and holiness. That's his stronghold. And that's what he wants ours to be. I, I think I've said everything I need to say. I'm, I have. There's a, this is a treasure trove right here. And, and I'm just going to quote this. I'm going to show it to you. It's, we're going to go past one thing. Oh, we can read it too. It is the living word of God that secures freedom. That's what I've been preaching. Amen. Everybody read it with me. It is the living word of God that secures freedom. Now look. Hosea, my, read it with me. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Since you rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my Cohen. This is to the priest. Since you forgot the Torah of your God, just so I will forget your children. Wow. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. 
because you rejected Torah. You didn't want to get in my word. You don't want to see what it says. I'll reject you and your children. Listen, one more verse I want to tell you. I, I'm, most of you know this verse from the Brit Hadashah, from I believe it's Romans uh, chapter 10. You could say it with me. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Say it with me. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's actually the, the actual Greek, I think, is, is Christos, the word of Messiah. Either way, it's the word coming out of heaven for us. And the problem is not that we don't have the word of God. Listen, the printing press came in the 1400s. Before that, people didn't have scriptures like we do. I wonder how many of you, listen, if you have at least one set of scriptures in your house that's not your personal Bible, but it's another set of scriptures, another Bible, would you raise your hand? If you have more than one version, would you raise two hands? Could you raise a leg? No, I'm just teasing. Okay. <laughs> They're all over our house. They're everywhere. We got Bibles galore. I met with a man this week that, that, that grew up in a Jewish family, and he said, man, Jewish people don't talk like they have a relationship with God. They don't pray like they do. They have to pray the prayers that are prescribed. But listen, people, that Bible that's sitting all over your house, translations galore, Bibles galore, it does nothing sitting on your shelf except gather dust. And, and here's the problem, and God forbid that we would get this in America, although I feel like we're starting it, and that's this. Behold, the days are coming, declares my Lord Adonai, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of Adonai. So people will wander from sea to sea and roam from north to east searching for the word of Adonai, but they will not find it. And that doesn't mean they don't have any Bibles in their home anymore. It means they don't seek the word of the Lord and listen to hear what God is saying. And if you don't do it, you're going to wash out at some point. That's enough. Father, Lord, God, I love these people because you love this people. You love us. You so love the world that you gave Mashiach to die. But Lord, after we come to faith and believe in him, it's just the beginning. He said, if we really believe, if we really want to be disciples indeed, we'll get in that word. We'll establish a daily routine of being in that word. Lord, we'll, we'll turn the TV off to be in that word. If we missed you that morning, as Rabbi Ron has taught us so many times, if you miss God early in the morning, you'll look for him all day long. Abba, help us to find you early and to stay with you all day. Help us to develop a reading pattern, a meditating in your word, seeing ourselves in your word and seeing yourselves in us that, that we might be pleasing in your sight. Oh, God and Father of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen and amen.